It was 1978, and I was a freshman at St. Augustine High School, locally known as Saints. I had one foot firmly in adulthood, and the other stubbornly pulling me free from childhood like a boot stuck in mud. I was gangly, not quite grown into my body, quick, quick to mask my budding teenage angst with sophomoric humor. At 14 years old, the world was a confusing stew of navigating the present and grasping the promise of the future. Back then, San Diego was part Navy town, part sleepy beach city on the cusp. Padre tickets were five bucks. The chickens still belonged to KGB FM. <laughs> there were a couple of holdout farms in Mission Valley, and the Chargers broke our hearts every goddamn December. <laughs> Like me at the time, you could argue it was a city in its early adolescence. High school should have been the context in which I was transformed in the next iteration of myself and put on a trajectory towards a successful adulthood. During that time, I was struggling academically due to untreated learning disabilities. Socially, I was naturally anxious and I was a bit mopey. On September 25th, 1978, at 9 a.m. in the morning, PSA Flight 182, a Boeing 727 full of passengers coming to San Diego from Sacramento, collided midair with a Cessna over North Park. Between the first and second period, standing by the fence on the lower field, we heard the boom from above. I watched the burning Cessna cartwheel, wagging a tail of fire and smoke, spiraling, somersaulting, earthbound. A stoner kid pulled my arm and yelled, look, I turned to look just in time to see the jet disappear behind houses and palm trees on the horizon. We felt the boom, a shudder earthquake strong shot a queasy feeling into my gut. We watched the fireball, then the mushroom cloud, first orange, then black as oil. After the boom, the world seemed to st stand momentarily still. Soon the stunned silence gave way to screams, followed by loud nervous banner, then confusion. Saints is an all-boys Catholic school, and kids came from all over San Diego to attend. A handful of kids from the neighborhood ran home in panic. Priests and teachers jumped into cars, racing off, their tires screeching to help, to rescue the rescuable, but there was no one to rescue. Smoke thick and greasy, black in the sky. A Santa Ana breeze carried the acrid smell of burned rubber, jet fuel, and wood smoke. The kids who didn't run to the crash simply milled around, unsure of what to do. The teachers who stayed with us had little to offer. There was no contingency plan for this. Time dragged on. Sirens finally sounded. Police cars, fire trucks, and ambulances flooded the area. The sirens blasted all morning and cried until we finally were sent home. My ears rang. I was with a group of freshmen still standing by the lower field, waiting, nervous with speculation. We stood outside for hours, milling, watching it unfold slowly, painfully. My legs ached. I was hot, thirsty, and growing increasingly anxious. Still, we waited for some instruction, for some update, for anything to make this normal. After an hour, shell shot kids and teachers began to trickle back like zombies from the crash. We heard snippets of information about bodies still strapped to their seats hanging in trees. Burned body parts, smoldering body parts strewn everywhere for blocks. One kid described luggage in trees, luggage smashed through the roofs of parked cars. Others said an entire block was on fire. They described the smell of burning metal. They saw cars melting. They reported the horror, the horror. Still, we waited, unsure observers of something unimaginable. More kids returned from the crash and joined us near the lower field. Then the rumors started. Supposedly, some stoner kid took a severed hand and stashed it in his locker so he could steal the diamond ring on it. I heard some senior grab a piece of the plane. He was showing it off behind the gym. My buddy Rolo swore he saw it. Later, we heard about some so nameless sophomore kid who lived in the neighborhood who ran home to find his house was just gone, a hole in the ground. His mother and baby brother were gone, too. Over time, the stories morphed as stories do. I still don't really know what was true or the product of a horrific game of telephone. Next, the helicopters landed on the football field, news trucks parked on the grass. Still, we waited for some instruction, some explanation. Then, the body bags came on a never-ending assembly line. Seniors and teachers, cops and firemen, all pitching in. 
Our gym served as a makeshift morgue. First, they laid the bodies out on the football field in rows. We watched numbly as they moved them inside. The pallbearers sweated, somber faced, somehow remaining calm as they complicated, er, completed their gruesome task. Inside, the priest gave last rites to the incomplete anonymous dead. Around noon, they finally told us to go home. But there were no cell phones in 1978. The landlines went down with the jet. All the roads in the area were closed, so we walked to the bus stop. But there were no buses running. We kept walking. All the kids in my carpool walked together. We walked for miles. I was hot, exhausted, thirsty, and numb. We finally arrived home five hours later. Our parents asked, are you okay? We said we were, but it was really too soon to know. They closed school for a full week. The week after the crash, the school was on the national news every night. The, no the morning we came back, we held a mass for the dead in the same gym that housed them the week before. The priest read 147 names. These are the first memories of my few, first few days of high school. That crash transformed people in predictable ways. Teachers and older kids suffered from PTSD before we called it PTSD. Some kids left school, it was just too much for them to come back. Several teachers told us that they would never fly again, stuck forever in the long shadow of PSA Flight 182. Our principal, Father Wasco, told us he forced himself to get on a plane the next week or he would never fly again. Looking back on it some 45 years later, something unpredictable happened too. 150 traumatized 14-year-olds were cut loose. No crisis counseling, no therapy, no processing what we saw, one mask, then suck it up buttercup and move on. What could possibly go wrong? At the, at the time, Saints was less than a thousand students. There was a small faculty of priests, brothers, and lay folk. The administration was a mom and pop operation at best. Processes and procedures were stuck in the 1950s. The classes above mine knew the rules, routines, and norms, and they followed them. The freshman class was, unintentionally, left to figure it out and expected to follow suit. It didn't happen. We became the problem class. Our class turned into something fundamentally different than those before us and those that came after us. By the third anniversary of the crash, our unruly behavior had driven out half the faculty. By my count, 17 teachers quit over the three, week, or over the three years post-crash. Those who stayed had mostly given up on our class, taken to the bottle, or were simply trying to survive until they could find a better job. Likewise, our class had dwindled from 150 promising Catholic school kids to 75 feral frat boys. <laughs> the attrition can be attributed to guys getting kicked out, and it wasn't easy to get kicked out back then either. It required some major transgression. I'm talking about things like blowing up the school dumpster with a half stick of dynamite. <laughs> things like stealing your religion teacher's car and dumping it in Tijuana, then leaving, leaving him a nice note and a six pack thanking him for the use of his ride. Despite our diminished ranks, and thanks to our annex, by the fall of my senior year, things hit a new low at Saints, and it all became a bit surreal. The fall started with a communal football betting pot where we pooled our money as a class and bet on college football games. By the sixth week of the season, we had amassed over $4,000, and the local bookie would no longer take our action. Being resourceful, our class appointed myself and another respectable lad to ditch school on a crisp fall morning, fly to Las Vegas, place a bet at the Golden Nugget, and fly right back. <laughs> I was selected because I didn't fear getting on a plane. My buddy was terrified. We flew PSA. We made it back for the pep rally that afternoon. No one noticed we were missed, that we missed school. The next morning, Nebraska's kicker missed a, sh a chip shot field goal, and our big roller days were over. <laughs> For most of that fall, a dead skunk tied to a skateboard rolled up and down the hallway of the main building. It would disappear and reappear like a phantom, the stench growing worse over time. <laughs> Things hit a new low after the holidays when our vice principal got on the PA and issued the warning. Whoever defecated in the planner in the main office has five minutes to turn himself in. We know who you are. I was left wondering whether they had an ass print. When I got pneumonia that winter, I was bedridden for two weeks. 
No one ever called to ask where I was or why I wasn't in school. No teacher asked me to make up any work. Academically, I learned nothing during high school. Half the time, I never bothered turning in assignments. Attending class was merely a suggestion rather than a requirement. And by the time I graduated high school, I was behind in every subject. I could barely write or do math beyond the simplest equations. If the checks cleared, they moved you through. I graduated with no plan. After graduation, I only enrolled at Mesa College when the track coach asked me to join the team. Sitting in my first college classes, I literally realized that I didn't know how to study. I had to learn simple things, like if the word was in bold in the book, it was probably important. <laughs> Luckily, my parents got me the help I needed to address my learning issues, and going to Mesa gave me the time to catch up. From there, despite my slow start, and no thanks to saints, I was able to thrive academically. <laughs> For me personally, the crash was an abstraction when it happened. I had lived long enough to know it was tragic, but not long enough to comprehend the magnitude of the suffering it caused. I can honestly say it impacts me more now as an adult than when I lived through it. I now can imagine the devastation the poor families left behind and the sheer terror of the folks on the plane when it went down. Despite that, I've logged over a half million miles in the air since the crash, and I've never once been afraid to get on a plane. I guess I've always adopted a when it's your time, it's your time worldview. My overall high school experience was akin to being an army platoon that got, developed, or got deployed to a hot zone the week after basic training. We became a band of immature brothers thrown together under god-awful circumstances and left to figure it all out. We still call each other when the chips are down. And after 45 years, they're still talking about our class. A year ago, my 23-year-old son had some of his buddies over had gone to Saints. When they found out I was in the fabled class of 82, they, they knew all the stories and they wanted the details. They wanted to know if it was all true. I said, grab a beer, boys, have a seat, and then I spent an hour answering their questions. <laughs> Academically, I might not learn a damn thing when I, I was supposed to learn at Saints, but in the end, it worked out all right. Given my learning issues, my slow start would probably was the best thing for me. I needed the time to learn how to learn. I did learn one big thing at Saints. Big bad things do happen. Those things have hor horrific consequences for some people and less tragic for others. But big tragedies like the crash have octopus arms and life, uh, long half-life. When you live through them, they might recede into the shadows and your life goes on. But if you stop and reflect, you begin to understand that the, while those scars might fade, they never really go away. J.D. Clapp, everyone. J.D. Clapp.